Well, welcome back everyone for week three of our uh, class here on um, Christian nationalism in the United States. Uh, let's just review really quickly. Um, for those of you who maybe, I don't know, maybe some people are jumping in for the first time today. Uh, and again, I, I, I told Debbie, I will, um, after week four, I'm just running this as one big PowerPoint. So, so uh, I, will, uh, I will send um, the PowerPoint to Debbie and then anyone who wants to, to have it um, can be, you know, is free to, is free to uh, ask her for it. Um, again, a lot of this stuff uh, comes out of my book, Was America Founded as a Christian Nation? And I've taken a lot of the information, I've kind of repurposed it in this class to just kind of bring it to the contemporary debate over, you know, Christian nationalism that we're seeing here. But again, by nature, I am a historian. So, so you know, I'm always thinking about, you know, how we get to certain moments uh, in history and the sort of continuities uh, between the past and the present, and even in some cases, the change over time between past uh, and present, what's useful today and what's not uh, from the past. Uh, so in week one, we looked at this, uh, we defined our terms, we defined um, what we mean when we talk about Christian nationalism today. I tried to suggest it was a relatively new term uh, that, that really has cropped up in the last decade or so. We compared that to um, civil religion, which is a slightly different uh, concept that is not as particular. I mean, when I say particular, I mean the use of Christianity and Christian symbols is much more vague um, than in the way Christian nationalists choose that. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about this today when we, when we look at the Declaration of Independence. Last week, uh, I um, wanted to just focus a little bit on the way the Bible was used in the American Revolution, um, but also, again, talking about, you know, I challenge my students to think historically, right, and thinking historically, part of that involves continuity, right, and I tried to make an argument between the, con the continuity between the past and the present using some recent statements uh, you know, uh, well, actually relatively recent statements from Mike Pence and how he used the Bible and trying to make a connection between the way in which the Bible was used by political for political purposes today uh, in the same way that it was used at the time of the American Revolution. These things are not new. Politicians love quoting the Bible. Uh, and usually they quote the Bible in really interesting and innovative ways to kind of serve their political their political ends. So we talked a little bit about that. Um, and then um, today what I wanna do is I wanna take a, a kind of surface level dive into the, the founding documents. Again, hopefully these, um, you know, I, with 45 minutes or less, you know, when you think about, uh, think about uh, time for question and answers and discussion, you know, all I can really do here is kind of point you to resources and give you a kind of surface level understanding, at least raise the kinds of questions that hopefully you'll be able to explore on your own if you're interested. Um, and, you know, I've been trying to give you resources as well uh, to think about some of these, uh, some of these issues. But today we're going to talk about Christianity and the founding uh, documents. And I really just want to focus on the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution, uh, and particularly as they relate to Christian, Christian ideas, the Bible, Christian beliefs, so forth. So let's start with the Declaration of Independence. Um, let me first suggest that um, the Declaration of Independence in its original 18th century context uh, was really doing a different kind of work than the way we use the Declaration of Independence today. I think that's important. Again, we talked about continuity a few seconds ago, but sometimes, you know, the past, the 18th century is a different world than the present. When we think about the Declaration of Independence, we are normally thinking about the words um, in the first couple of paragraphs. Right, and usually what comes to mind are things like, you know, we, 
we uh, are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, namely life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or the idea that all men are created equal, which we spent some time last week in light of someone's question, kind of analyzing that phrase, what, it, what equality kind of really meant to many of these white founding fathers. Um, but we tend to focus on those first two paragraphs because they represent a kind of political philosophy, political ideas, right? Equality, where our rights come from, what our what are our rights, right? You know, and in some ways that's a really bad historical way of thinking about the Declaration of Independence, especially if you're going to suggest that those ideas about all men being created equal and alienable rights and so forth endowed by our creator if you're gonna if you're gonna believe that think that those are uniquely American ideas right which you often hear from Christian nationalists right uh, America is exceptional we are the only nation that believe that our rights came from God um, we're the only ones who believe that um, you know, we have these inherent natural rights and so forth. Um, but if you really think about it and you really understand this document in its context in, this, in 1776, Thomas Jefferson, when he wrote these words, and he, again, he is the primary author of the Declaration of Independence, was really just echoing things that most people in the English speaking, especially the British world, already knew. Uh, these were not uniquely American ideas, but Thomas Jefferson was able to articulate these ideas about equality, um, again, quality in quotes, right, um, about individual rights, about our rights coming from our creator. You know, these were all ideas that would have been circulating in the kind of political and intellectual world of, of England uh, at the time. They were really products of uh, some wor work that had been done by John Locke and others a um, hundred years earlier. Uh, and some might even argue that a lot of the principles embedded in the Declaration would have been sort of common language for Britain, British people who were familiar with, say, the Magna Carta, stemming all the way back to 1215, right? These have been around. Um, Britain was a great liberty-loving country in which people had rights we tend to give them a, a bad rap because we know we separated from England, right? But when you compare England to all of the other uh, nations in the world, which are essentially autocratic, dictatorial, absolutist uh, monarchs with no rights for the people, uh, you know, the, the, the classic example here is right across the English Channel in France, you know, where there was no constitution, no assembly, no parliament checking the king and so forth. Great Britain is one of the most liberty loving places on earth, right? And the colonies were part of that empire. So nothing new here to speak of. And even the founding fathers, the people who wrote the Declaration of Independence or involved in the writing, they also knew that uh, in the 18th century and reflected upon it that way. So I would argue that in its context in the 18th century, again, we talk all the time, right, about the original intent of the Constitution, right? You know, we want to get originalists, certain conservatives will say, right? We want Antonin Scalia or Neil Gorsuch or Amy Coney Barrett, right? People who were originalists who are going to interpret the Constitution in its original writing in the 1780s. We never talk about the original intent of the Declaration of Independence. What was the purpose of the Declaration of Independence? Well, I would argue that the Declaration of Independence was not to offer any new ideas that people didn't already know. The Declaration of Independence was simply that. It was a declaration to the world that America was now going to operate as an independent and sovereign nation. Um, you know, America's in the middle of a war when the Declaration of Independence is written. Uh, they are appealing to places like France, like Russia, like Spain, right? To say, look, you know, we're gonna need your help in this. 
right? We're going to need your support, your troops, your money, and so forth to sustain this war against uh, Great Britain, who also happened to be their arch rivals, you know, in Europe. And we need your help and support to do this. And here we're just declaring now that we are an independent nation and we, you know, and that we want you to know that. Um, so in some ways, rather than looking at the Declaration of Independence in its context as some kind of, um, some kind of document that's propagating brand new ideas that no one has ever seen before, American exceptionalists, right? The Declaration of Independence, I would tend to view in its context much more as a kind of foreign policy document, right, to, to announce to the world. And, and again, this is how I put these quotes here, right? So here's Thomas Jefferson right at the end of his life, writing to a fellow Virginian, Henry Lee. And listen to what he says. When forced, therefore, to resort to arms for redress, right, in other words, the revolution, right, the war, an appeal to the tribunal of the world was deemed proper for our jurisdiction. This was the object of the Declaration of Independence, not to find out new principles or new arguments never before thought of, which is you know, what I just said, but to place before mankind the common sense of the subject in terms so plain and firm as to command their assent and to justify ourselves in the independent stand we are compelled to take. Again, notice nothing new, even Jefferson says that, right? Jefferson was just drawing on a body of British thought. Or here's John Adams in 1782. John Adams was a member of the committee uh, that wrote the, that designed the, you know, Jefferson, it's in Jefferson's words, but the committee included John Adams, um, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman from Connecticut, and um, um, uh, John Livingston from New York. Uh, but here's Adams in 1782. The Declaration of Independence was that memorable act by which the United States assumed an equal station among nations. Or I believe this is Adams again. I don't have the exact quote here, but I believe this is Adams again in the early 19th century. The Declaration of Independence was merely an occasional state paper. It was a solemn exposition to the world of the causes which had compelled the people of a small portion of the British Empire to cast off their allegiance and renounce the protection of the British king and to dissolve their social connection with the British people. Right, that's it. I mean, that's literally what it is, right? A declaration of independence. Now, today, we think of the Declaration of Independence as something different than what it was originally intended to be. And there's nothing wrong with that, but we have appropriated it to advance certain American ideals and American values. So, you know, three examples of the way we've done this. Uh, and I think I said this on the during the first uh, week, the Declaration of Independence has kind of taken on this idea of American scripture. If we think about civil religion, like we defined it on week one, you know, the, 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 the scripture of, the, of Christianity is, of course, the Bible. The scripture of America, where we go to find our values and who we are as a people, right, is the Declaration of Independence. And I would argue that the Declaration of Independence became American scripture over time in, as we advance into the 19th century. So for example, the person on the right you see there, I don't know if you notice her or recognize her, but that's Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the great defender of uh, women's rights. Her and Susan B. Anthony and others in 1848 met in Seneca Falls, New York at the uh, first women's rights conference, so to speak, Seneca Falls Convention. And it was in Seneca Falls that they issued the Declaration of the Rights of Women. And if you read the Declaration of the Rights of Women, you will see that basically what they are doing is they are taking the first two paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence, and they are including women. All men and women are created equal, right? And they're adding women into the first couple of paragraphs. In other words, they're taking those very British ideas that Thomas Jefferson and everybody knew in 18th century, and they're saying, hey, what about the women, right? Um, and at that, in that sense, uh, you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony and the Seneca Falls Convention is taking 
these texts, these first two paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence and turning them into something more, something you know, in which we, we want to apply these to all people, right? The abolitionists often appeal to the Declaration of Independence. The guy in the middle there is uh, William Lloyd Garrison, one of the great uh, abolitionists of the 19th century. I could have also put um, Frederick Douglass, uh, the African-American, um, uh, the former slave abolition who became an abolitionist. They appealed to the idea that all men are created equal, right, in their fight against slavery. And then after the Battle of Gettysburg, you have Abraham Lincoln in November going to Gettysburg and giving his famous address in which he starts off, right, four score and seven years ago, right, for a score is 20 years seven years added to that, that's 87 years. I always ask my students to do the math. 1863 minus 87 gets you to 1776, right? It's a direct appeal to the Declaration of Independence, right? And in other words, then, when the Declaration of Independence is applied to these particular moments in American history, women's rights, abolition of slavery, the birth of a new nation after the uh, civil, uh, civil War, then those first two paragraphs begin to take on a kind of sense of American value and scripture in the way that they had not in the 18th century. So what does this have to do with Christian nationalism? Um, I think it has a lot to do with Christian nationalism because so often you have Christian nationalists appealing to the original intent of the constitution, right? For, you know, we need to get back to what the founders believed about the constitution. And then we need to make decisions in our policy today based upon those original ideas. But oftentimes we, they, Christian nationalists will appeal to the God language of those first two paragraphs, the creator language of the first two paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence, um, but they're not really particularly interested in original intent of those, right? They're much more interested in the way in which um, people in the 19th, 20th centuries uh, interpreted those two, um, those two paragraphs. So I'll throw that out there. Maybe you'll have some questions about that during the discussion, but I want to just move on and get some more information out there for you to sort of stimulate your thinking. Now, the Declaration of Independence does mention God for, or I should say references, makes a reference to God four times um, in, in, its, uh, in, its, uh, in the course of its writing. Um, and I thought I had highlighted this one in red too, but I didn't. Um, but, but some of this is familiar language to many of you, right? The declaration begins when in the course of human events, um, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God, if I could highlight those in red, that's what I wanna talk about here, entitle them. So we immediately see Jefferson making a reference here to God in the first paragraph. Again, nothing new here. Most everybody would, you know, everyone in the British world would have talked about God as the God of nature. There is nothing here specific about this God. This is not a God who incarnated himself in the form of a man and died for the sins of the world. This is not a triune God. This is not a God who raises the dead or performs miracles, you know, so forth. And when Jefferson here is appealing to nature's God, I would argue that he's, he's appealing to certainly draw, he certainly has the sort of Judeo-Christian God in mind. Um, but not necessarily a God who, who is active in the world. This is very much a God who uh, you know, has created the world, uh, but yet it's a God who kind of vaguely presides over nature or maybe doesn't even preside over nature, maybe created nature and let it run by certain natural laws. In other words, there's a kind of universal appeal here. Jefferson lives in an intellectual world, the enlightenment, 
in which not everybody believes in Christianity. Um, and I think he's making this kind of very general appeal to the laws of nature, the laws of science, the laws of physics, the laws of morality, um, you know, the laws of politics, right? These natural rights. Certainly he believes they come from God, but it's, it's not, you know, he wants to create a kind of umbrella in which people who maybe don't believe in a God that intervenes in human affairs could also be part of this new political experiment uh, that he is creating. Nature's God was very much a God used by people known as deists uh, in the 18th century. These would have been people who believed that God was a creator God but then let the world run according to the laws that this creator God created, right? Um, and did not intervene in human affairs, right? Did not answer prayer, did not raise the dead, did not perform miracles uh, and so forth. So it's hard to argue anything beyond this reference to God is kind of anything beyond this kind of as a vague kind of almost like a civil religion back to week one, right? you know, an appeal to nature's God. The second time the Declaration of Independence references God in some way is in the phrase, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Uh, of course, some of you know, these words, again, are drawn from the 17th century political philosopher, John Locke. Uh, they are not unique to Thomas Jefferson. Locke, of course, said, as some of you may know, um, that we have our inalienable rights are life, liberty, and property, right? It was important. Property rights were important to him. Jefferson replaced property with the pursuit of happiness. And most historians would argue he does that in order to um, appeal to all people. And largely, again, this gets back to someone's question from last week, largely kind of white people who don't own property, right? Um, you know, some people would say, well, he took property out because he, you know, slavery, he didn't want slavery in there because people thought slaves were property. You know, and that's, you know, that's, that is true. People understood slaves as property, but I don't think that's why Jefferson or Jefferson replaced property with the pursuit of happiness. But this idea that these rights that people have somehow come from God is a longstanding British idea, right? There's nothing uniquely American about this idea, right? We are the only nation in which you hear this all the time on TV. We are the only nation that was founded on the belief that our rights come from God. That's just, that's just terrible history. I mean, the British had been saying this since like the 13th century, right? <laughs> since the Magna Carta. Um, now, what's really fascinating to me is Jefferson's first draft of the Declaration of Independence. Now, the, the final draft is, is the one above there, the quote. But in the first draft, he says this, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, right? So in other words, right, all human beings are created equal. And that from, and from, that, from that equal creation, they derive rights inherent and inalienable. Now, again, here you have still a reference to human beings being created, but there is not a reference to the capital C creator, right, in this sense. And it seems to imply that God created all human beings. And then on the virtue of the fact that everybody's equal, that's where our rights come from. And those rights are not particularly defined in this kind of Lockean triumvirate in the way that we saw, um, saw earlier. So again, I, I find that very interesting that in the original draft, Jefferson did not have endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And of course, this has taken on a life of its own, this idea of creator, you know, created with, with unalienable rights. You know, I mean, some people then take these words, 1776, and somehow apply them to the, the Bill of Rights, 
which was written 14 or 15 years later in 1791, and essentially say like that our creator or the scriptures or the Bible or whatever gave us the right to, um, you know, bear arms, right? You know, or God gave us the right to a trial by jury, you know, or these kinds of things. I mean, in some ways, that's really a historical stretch uh, that many will make. Now, the other two references to God in the Declaration of Independence, most people don't think about because they come at the end of the document. Um, one is at the end, it says, we appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and authority of the good people, uh, so forth, declare ourselves independent states. Um, Clearly, Jefferson's God here is a God that one day seems to will somehow judge the world, judge people. We don't know how, we don't know the, the details, but there is a, a certain strain of kind of enlightenment deist kind of thought that Jefferson is probably tapping into here, which says God created the world. God let the world run by natural law and causes. And then he's going to come back at the end and judge human beings based upon ethics or, you know, whether they've been good people uh, or whatever. But nevertheless, this God of the Declaration of Independence, you know, he creates, we saw, he gave us rights, and he's also one day going to judge us um, for the rectitude of our intentions, whatever that uh, kind of means, very vague language here. And then finally, uh, the Declaration of Independence says, and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. Um, here is probably the, the closest we get to a Christian uh, God, but we're not, we're no way there yet, right? Um, you know, this is the, the reference to providence is this idea that there is a God who is active. And I think all of the founding fathers, especially George Washington, who had nothing to do with the Declaration of Independence, but George Washington was always appealing to providence, right? That there's a God who watches over people, who protects people, uh, who exerts his will in the world. Um, I think the founding fathers and Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence believed that there was a God who was, could be active at times. Uh, and maybe sort of monitoring this whole creation that, that he created. Um, and this was enough to put into the Declaration of Independence. So where do we conclude on the Declaration of Independence? Um, they want to spend, uh, we're gonna spend bulk of our time here. I still wanna say a few words about the Constitution. But the Declaration of Independence in many ways um, certainly is a, what we call philosophers at least call a theistic, document, T-H-E-I-S-T-I-C, in the sense that it says that there is a God, that that God created us, that that God will judge us, and that that God um, sort of rules over providence. It is certainly not a Christian document in its language because we don't know much about that God, right? That God could be a Unitarian God who, who watches over us, right? It may not be a triune God. Um, it's certainly, again, as I said before, not a God who had a plan of redemption, you know, or Jesus dying on the cross or that, G you know, sent his son into the world and so forth. Um, but again, it's a very kind of vague reference to um, God and providence. So I'll leave the Declaration of Independence there. We'll maybe have some questions about that because I want to say at least a couple words here about the Constitution. And I say only a couple words about the Constitution because there's really not much to say about the God language within the Constitution. Um, the Constitution mentions religion once. And that is in, again, as it was written in 1787, I should say, it men mentions religion once. And that is in Article 6. And it essentially says there will be no religious test or no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. 
In the United States Constitution, if you want to hold a office in the federal government, the national government created by the Constitution, you can be a Christian, you can be a Muslim, you can be a Hindu, or you could be an atheist, or you could be anything. There is no religious test uh, for office, and that includes the presidency of the United States. Right, at least on paper. Right, that's how uh, that's how it's um, how it's laid out. Now, when you get to the First Amendment, which was written actually three or four years later, you have more specific religious language, um, and there it talks about um, there will be no established church. In other words, your taxpayer money will not go to pay for a state or national religion, right? There will be no official church, much like say the Anglican or the Church of England in, um, in, in England or Catholicism in France, right, at this time. No established church. This is known as the disestablishment clause. And article one also talks about the free exercise of religion. You are free to exercise your faith without government interference um, in that kind of worship. So in some ways, the constitution is a very um, sort of secular document. It allows for freedom of religion. It, it does not establish a state church and it says no test of oaths for office. Now, if you remember your American history, you know that prior to the constitution, there was uh, something called the Articles of Confederation. And under the Articles of Confederation, each state had the power to write their own laws and constitution, right? So there's, remember there's now after the revolution, there's 13 individual state constitutions that then are going to um, and coexist in 1787 with the United States Constitution, right? Now, under the Articles of Confederation, there was no US Constitution. There was nothing holding the nation together in certain terms of a document. So each state had their own constitutions. If you look at those state constitutions, you get a real mess when it comes to this question, trying to define this, right? So here I just list some of them. Um, you know, so look at Delaware, for example. Delaware has no religious establishment, no state church in Delaware, right? There's no official church. However, if you want to hold office in Delaware, you must profess in God, Jesus Christ, very Christian, right? You know, Jews, Jews are not allowed, right? And the inspiration of the Old and New Testament. In Georgia, no state church, but if you want to hold office, you have to be a Protestant. Can't even be Catholic there. In Maryland, there will be a tax that you'll have to pay to support the Christian religion. And again, most of this is done with you pay the tax and then they divide the tax up to the different churches, right? Um, Massachusetts, all of your tax money that you pay for religion goes directly to the congregational church, which is the established church. And so on down the line. Now, of course, some of you may be eager to learn about Pennsylvania, right? Um, Pennsylvania, free religiously free William Penn all the way back to the founding right of the of the of the state you know you're free to worship the way you want but look at this office holders must believe in one god as creator and governor of the universe the rewarder of the good and the punisher of the wicked and also must acknowledge the scriptures of the old and new testaments to be given by divine inspiration if you want to be an office holder in Pennsylvania, you have to affirm the old and new, the inspiration of the Old and New Testaments. You see how the state constitutions are quite different on these questions 
than the national constitution, which has no establishment and no religious tests for office. My favorite one is Vermont, you know, because Vermont today is known as this kind of bastion of secularism, right? They were the first state to endorse gay marriage and, you know, all of these things. But look at Vermont's constitution in 1777, right? No religious establishment, right? But every sector denomination of people ought to observe the Sabbath or the Lord's Day and keep up and support some sort of religious worship, which to them shall seem most agreeable to the revealed will of God. You must be a Protestant. You must believe in the inspiration of the Bible, uh, one God, the creator and governor of the universe and so forth. So this creates a really interesting situation because many of these constitutions existed and coexisted, I should say, with the federal constitution. So, you know, you could you couldn't you could be any religion you want and hold federal office. But in the individual states, you couldn't hold office if you did not believe in these religious um, oaths, right? You didn't take these religious oaths. Moreover, let's just say Pennsylvania, right? Pennsylvania, you could worship any way you want or not worship. You could, you know, Pennsylvania has Jewish congregations. They have um, Catholic con uh, congregations, Protestant congregations, Quakers, and so forth. Right. No one's going to interfere with your right to worship in Pennsylvania. But if you want to hold office. Right. You need to conform to Old and New Testament scriptures. Now. This this creates, you know, in some cases, like, for instance, Massachusetts, you know, their their congregational establishment and Christian test oath for office, it goes all the way up till the 1830s. Right. So people in mass, people who maybe would hold a position in the federal government might not be able to qualify to hold a position in the state government if they were, say, uh, uh, um, a Muslim or a Catholic. Right. Or a Jew. Now. All of this changes, of course, maybe not, of course, I'm not sure, uh, but all of this changes. When. Uh, the Civil War takes place. And the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution essentially is going to say that states must abide by the federal constitution. The issue here, of course, is slavery, right? In other words, if you're in South Carolina and you say, hey, we slavery is legal here, Right. And the U.S. now the U.S. Constitution is saying with the passing of the 13th Amendment that it's not. The 14th Amendment then says, if you have slaves in South Carolina, you're in violation of the Constitution. In other words, you see what I'm saying there? The, con the federal Constitution is applied to the states. And then in 1947, in that Everson versus Board case we talked about on the first week, I think it was, um, the Supreme Court applied the 14th Amendment to religion. And thus it would be illegal today for the state of Pennsylvania, unconstitutional today for the state of Pennsylvania to require office holders to believe in the Old and New Testaments to be given by divine inspiration because the Supreme Court ruled that the 14th Amendment also applies to religion. Now, if we had more time, I would go into Virginia because Virginia is a really interesting case because they have no established tests oaths or whatever. In many ways, Virginia becomes the model for the US federal constitution. But um, I've actually gone longer than I wanted to go this morning and uh, I will stop there. Um, we are supposed to be stopping at 9.45. Um, but I'll stay like I like I've done the last two weeks. I'll stay until ten o'clock, and um, answer whatever questions you have, or you know, feel free to email me with questions. My email is j f e a j f as in Frank e a at messiah edu. So I'll stop there and see what kind of comments or questions you have. It's good to see. I would you. I would like to take the conversation back to the article from the New Yorker that just appeared in the past week. 
yeah. about uh, local politicians who are counting on Christian nationalism yeah. for um, getting elected. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's there's a there's a general uh, the, the, Kathy here is pointing to an article in The New Yorker this week about uh, uh, Adams County. I think he has other counties, too. Um, Franklin know. County, his biggest <clears throat> his biggest city is not even Gettysburg. It's He's saying Gettysburg yeah. because that gets the yeah. publicity. But his well, biggest population is not even in Adams County. It's Franklin County. OK, well, we're talking here about. Um, Again, I don't want to get too. Again, we're we're trying to talk about the 18th century stuff here, but I'll, I'll it's relevant, I think. So I'll just quickly mention this is Doug Mastriano, who is a Pennsylvania um, representative, who very much buys into these kinds of Christian nationalist ideas. The idea that America was founded as a Christian nation continues to be a Christian nation. Um, Kathy brings this up because I was actually cited in this New Yorker piece on Mastriano just very briefly, and I was kidding even though I talked to the woman for like 45 minutes I got you know a sentence in there which is fine that it happens all the time um but but there is a movement um and there's been it's been going on for for 20 years right but I think it was empowered in many ways by um by Donald Trump's presidency uh there's a movement to um you know for this Christian national these Christian nationalist ideas to to sort of seize uh seize government power right in other words it's you know when you hear people like mastriano and other christian nationalists they really have a very unnuanced and sometimes just flat out wrong uh view of the american founding and this is why i think the work of historians are so important um and again you know i Take it with a grain of salt. I, I I am one, so I'm you know I'm I'm trying to justify my own work here in some ways. But you know I tell teachers this, right? This is why the work of historians are so important because the entire Christian right movement that people like Doug Mastriano and others, my, even my representative uh, um, Reagan, Reagan, um, is he your representative too, state rep? I can't remember. You know is is buys into this idea. It's built upon a very simplistic and again sometimes wrong view of American history that America was somehow founded on these judeo-christian principles that um, need to be reclaimed renewed and restored this goes back to the first week when we defined these terms so I think the work of historians is so important here to sort of at least offer some places where that view of politics is built on a kind of really weak foundation, historical foundation. Um, you know, if Doug Mastriano wants to fight for, um, you know, different causes and so forth, let him do it, right? We live in a democracy. He can try to fight for any kind of cause he wants. Um, and, you know, if he has enough people to support him, he will. But what bothers me is he appeals to his audience uh, through um, a use of the past that is irresponsible, a you an appeal to American identity at the time of the founding that is um, largely in error, right? And he justifies this saying, this is what America is and was created to be. And I think this is the whole point of kind of what Christian nationalism does. This is what we tried to talk about in that first week when we kind of defined our terms. A lot of it is based upon history. If you can teach students good history, um, you know, it's going to change the way we, we appeal to uh, um, our politics in some ways. So I'll just leave it at that. You know, again, you can read Eliza Griswold's New Yorker piece, um, you know, if, if you if you're so inclined. Other questions. John, you just said something there that struck me. What? Where did this fail? Yeah. Was it the church? Was it schools? Was yeah. it all of the above and more? <laughs> Well, I think if there's a lot of ways to answer that question, Debbie, um, you know, first of all, remember most of the Christian, as we defined it on week one, most of this kind of Christian nationalism uh, is deeply rooted within uh, American evangelical culture, especially conservative evangelical culture. And evangelical culture there's a, a great book that everybody should read you know whether you're an evangelical christian or not um 
written in 1994 by a mentor of mine, Mark Knoll, the historian Mark Knoll, who taught many, many years at Wheaton College and then went to uh, Notre Dame. Uh, it's called The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. And what Knoll argues in that book is that evangelicals for almost their entire history in the United States have been an activist religion. They are about preaching the gospel, about getting people saved, about otherworldly things, right? Preparing people for eternity, about serving others. These are all, I, I identify as an evangelical Christian myself. So these, these are all good things. I'm not disparaging these things. But because evangelicals have been such an activist faith, they have not been a thinking faith. And, and, and evangelicals who, thi who, who are, are thinkers are going to also read history and understand, develop a more sophisticated understanding of politics and arts and literature and culture and all of these kinds of issues. Um, but because American evangelicals have not invested, and I'm talking about money here, have not invested in research and universities and so forth because they're always looking to you know why why do that why why give why give money to a, a some kind of intellectual outlet or some college or some magazine or people who are working on these issues when you can either give it to missionaries or uh you know you know you can give it to uh something else where where it's it's going to propagate you know more people being saved right um, and again, that's that's part of the problem. And, you know, some might not see it as a problem, but but that's what's going on. So when it came to all of those things we mentioned in week one with the decline of America's Christian identity, prayer in public schools, um, the IRS taking away tax exempt status from schools for um for, for, for segregating, for, for segregation, uh, Roe versus Wade, right? All of these things, evangelicals were not prepared for, and they reacted harshly to it in a political way that became the culture wars. And they needed, were always looking for a usable past, right? So they said, well, we're gonna fight this culture war against the forces of secularization, and we need a history to back it up. And without giving a whole lot of thought, they cherry picked what they needed from the past in order to promote their political agenda. So I think this is part of the problem. So if, for instance, a school teacher would be teaching a kind of nuanced view of American history, I hope in the way that I just did, right? I mean, you notice I was fairly nuanced. I tried to suggest that, you know, many of these state constitutions were very Christian, right? You know, if anyone is trying to promote a kind of nuanced view, suddenly that becomes a political football, right? And you have those on the left and those on the right fighting over what content is being taught in schools and thus getting people elected to school boards who are going to fight for this and that kind of view of American history and so forth. And it's become all politicized. So I think that's part of the reason where I think evangelicals have gone wrong. I think from the non-evangelical perspective and from the secular perspective, uh, I think they have not, you know, people, people who are not evangelical Christians, mainline Christians or, you know, Catholics or even non-Christians have not taken this seriously enough. They have not they have they have been caught by surprise with just how powerful this Christian right view of history is. They um, they don't realize how well funded this is. Um, they don't realize there are deep pockets who are funding this kind of reductionist, if I could use that word, or simplistic view of American history and have used the way history is being taught in schools and in the universities as a kind of boogeyman, right, uh, to fight against. So, um, you know, I could keep going on that question, Debbie, but but I think a lot of it is, a lot of it is, um, you know, it, it's, it's about politics and it's about money. And you have people like me, say it again, Kathy. 
Who are those deep pockets who are funding those? Well, there's all kinds of, I mean, the GOP uh, donors, you have the Koch brothers uh, out of Wichita, you have, um, um, you know, uh, again, I, if I'm blanking right now on some of the big, the my, big money donors, some of them we don't know. They fund places like the Heritage Foundation and these think tanks that promote these kinds of ideas. Um, but yeah, let me give that let me give that some more thought. But they're out there, um, and then, and then you have people like you know you have people like me or others who are kind of you know college professors who are trying to put out what I think at least you might half the room might disagree. I don't know, but I think good history who, um, you know, trying to create sites and so forth that are, you know, that are trying to put out, promote good ideas, but we just don't have the infrastructure or the, or the, the fine. And, you know, no one wants to promote nuance and complexity. No one wants to give money to that. No one wants to promote that kind of stuff, right? I mean, when I wrote my book, Was America Founded as a Christian Nation? My publicist would put me on conservative radio shows. And so the, the, the title of the book has a question mark, right? Was America founded as a Christian nation? Question mark. And I'd get on the show, usually they'd have me on, you know, some conservative radio show in Atlanta, like the seven to seven to 11 at night show or something. And, you know, the guy would say, we have John Fia here, you know, Christian, was America founded as a Christian nation? What's the answer? You know, and I would say, well, it's a pretty complex situation. And then it was almost like, the entire conversation was over. No one knew where to go after that because they assumed that I was there to, to promote some kind of political, right? I'm like, I'm a historian. I try to, you know, as a Christian and a historian, my Christian responsibility is to read the past in all its fullness and complexity and see what's there, not to cherry pick things out that I'm going to use to advance a left or right political kind of agenda. And most of these talk radio people they they didn't they didn't want want to hear that they thought I was there to you know my my the first edition of the book was you know red white and blue you know cover they, they thought I was there to promote some kind of some kind of political uh agenda so so again most people are not cons not interested in a kind of history that can't necessarily be used to promote their to promote their agendas. They're instead gonna fund history like the 1619 Project, for example, with the New York Times on slavery or Donald Trump's 1776 Project, both of which I have some serious historical problems with, by the way, that could be a whole other class. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, that's where the money gets focused in because these are historical projects that are very selective because they're meant to promote this or that um, you know, agenda. Hmm. Um, I have a question regarding um, the state constitutions. Yeah. Um, in in your book, um, was America founded a Christian nation? I mean, you touched a little bit on um, some of the things that uh, the states were doing um, in terms of um, even maybe persecuting um, other uh, denominations or yeah. other religious beliefs within the states. I'm not um, sure my screen not sure. talking here. I want to put a picture up, but go ahead. Keep talking, Matt. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Steve Waldman, but um, his book, Founding Faith, he puts um, a lot of, uh, he spends a lot of time talking about um, uh, the, the, the Bill of Rights and the development of, you know, that, that the amendment that develops the separation of church and state. And right. it seems like a lot of the founders, um, the only way that they were okay with it was that they could keep um, um, their state constitutions and allow for these um, um, religious states. You know, it was like, okay, we don't need to have a religious nation um, in our constitution, but yeah. the only way we're okay with that is if we can have our religious states. I think that was a, a big point that Waldman tried to make in yeah. Yeah. Um, his book, Founding Faith. And so I wonder what the founders would think um, if they were 
um, around when the 14th Amendment was then applied to religion and uh, churches, yeah. um, because it seems like they were, that was, that was the only way they were okay with the yeah. national um, separation of church and yeah. state was because it was okay for the states to have it. Yeah, we're going to talk about this a little bit, um, a little bit next week. Um, where we talk about the faith of the founding fathers and what they would have thought about all of this. But there's no clear answer to your question, Matt. The, the reason I just shared, can you all see that, that image here I just put up on my screen? I mean, this is, this is a, it's a 19th century painting, but it depicts 18th century um, Anglicans, which was the established church in Virginia, persecuting Baptists. It was common to drag the Baptists out of their meeting house, which is the house behind you in the background there, and, you know, bring them out. In this case, it looks like it's a little puddle or something, but bring them out to the river or the, 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 the pond and dunk their heads into the water, right? Uh, because they were Baptists, right? <laughs> they needed to be dunked. And this is just one of the more tame forms of religious persecution that took place. Um, so it, the question, I'll just quickly, our time's about up here, Matt, but I'll quickly respond to your thing about what they would think about the 14th Amendment. I think there would be diverse opinions uh, about the way the 14th Amendment was applied. Um, I think you have people like Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, uh, those men who fought for um, you know, complete separation of church and state, complete religious freedom, uh, would probably have endorsed uh, Supreme Court Justices Hugo Black's idea of a wall of separation between church and state, and that state should not, no state, national, and I'm very familiar with Waldman's argument, um, no state, Jefferson would argue, um, the United States of America, or Virginia or Pennsylvania should have an establishment of religion or um, some kind of a test oath for holding of religious office. Uh, again, this, these were the Virginians. Now, Patrick Henry had a little bit of a different view um, you know, than, than Madison and Jefferson. Again, no, we don't have time to go into that here. On the other hand, there would be those like, for example, the president of Princeton University, then known as the College of New Jersey, John Witherspoon, uh, or perhaps Patrick Henry, or perhaps John Jay, or some of the Federalists who became Federalists in the 1790s, John Adams, for example, who would argue that religion was still absolutely essential to creating a moral people, a moral republic, virtuous people who were often willing to sacrifice the greater good for their, their own rights for the greater good at times. So I think, you know, one of the th first things I say to my students is, you know, people will ask me, well, what do the founding fathers believe about X? What would they think about X, right? And I would say we need to disabuse ourselves of that idea that the founding fathers ever spoke on religion or any matter, ever spoke with a kind of unified, uh, unified voice. So it's 10.01, um, I wanna be uh, respectful here of the time and I will stop there, Debbie. John, thank you. Oh my gosh, you've given us lots more to think about and uh, we look forward to next week too. Okay. So, uh, one more week, one more week. We'll talk about the founders and their religious beliefs and we'll actually get a little bit more into Matt's question um, about how they thought about the role of religion in the Republic. Great. Thank you so much for your, your time and your answers. This has been wonderful. Great. Thank you for coming. John, thank you. Okay. Have a good day, everyone. Happy Sunday. Thank you.